Well, hey guys, thanks for joining me for another Veritas 2020 video as we begin to look at this extremely important topic that we call spiritual warfare. In the sixth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we read these words, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You've probably already noticed we're living in a time when the enemies of biblical Christianity are becoming bolder than ever in my lifetime, I think. And I've, I've lived several years now. But that fact carries many implications for those of us who are true followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the implications that I want us to focus on today is the fact that the spiritual war that we find ourselves in the middle of, it's not a matter of what we choose, it's just where God has placed us, but it's very, very real. Now, it's extremely important for us to realize, as the scripture we just got through reading makes very clear, we are not at war with other people. <laughs> No matter how much other people may from time to time despise us or may try to shut us up, which they do from time to time, it's still true that people are not our enemy. Even if other people decided that they hated us, <laughs> and even if they decided they hate God, we still love them. Jesus said very clearly and explicitly in his Sermon on the Mount, we are to love people, even if they hate us. But I say to you, Jesus said, love your enemies even. Pray for those who persecute you. So that's the attitude we're supposed to have as Christians. So Ephesians 6 makes it clear that our true enemies are not people. They are wicked spiritual forces that make up the kingdom of Satan. That would mean Satan and his ranks of demons. And sadly, way too many Christians have not learned how to engage these enemies the way God commands us to engage them. Some people call themselves Christians or even embarrassed to talk about things like this. You know, you start talking about Satan and his demons, they get embarrassed because they know the world just ridicules it. Well, the world's going to roll their eyes at it. And so they don't even want to talk about it, much less learn how to resist them. You know, they've heard secular people, unbelievers, laugh at the possibility that they're even real. You know what I'm saying, don't you? But again, we just have to keep reminding ourselves that when people seem to hate us, God says there are evil powers lying behind that hatred. The people themselves are really just blind. They're poor blinded pawns who are being used by our real enemy, who's the devil. So we want to make sure we keep that clear in our mind. Some Christians still seem a little surprised and amazed at the degree of hatred and antagonism and bitterness that's demonstrated toward us by sometimes politicians, sometimes television and movie producers and writers, sometimes leaders of other religions, sometimes leaders of popular movements in the country, sometimes other people in different cultural leadership positions. And sometimes it, it really can kind of take our breath away. We think, wow, it's amazing how blatant the opposition can be to clear biblical truth and it's just amazing especially when those same principles and those same truths seem to be so widely accepted or at least respected only a generation or so ago not that long ago not when you're as old as i am it seems like recent history well the solution for some christians is to try to downplay the truths that seem to make these people angry we're all kind of wired like that we have to be really careful why? Because we want people to like us, right? You, don't you want people to like you? I, I want people to like me too. We want the people to realize, hey, we're really nice people. We're, we're not mean. <laughs> but ultimately, guys, listen, this is hard to believe sometimes, and it's hard to accept. But we've got to understand it will never, ever work to just try to be so much like the world that they will think, oh, these are nice people. Yes, we better be nice people, nice in God's sense, kind, gracious, loving, but that means speaking the truth. And if we intend to be true to Jesus and true to God's word, 
we can expect some resistance. You know what they did to Jesus for being the truth and speaking the truth? They crucified him, right? You know what they did to Paul for proclaiming the truth everywhere he went? Yeah, they beheaded him. You know what they did to Stephen for simply speaking the truth there in Jerusalem? Yeah, they stoned him. I mean, and you know what Jesus said? He said, listen, if the world hates you, just know that it's hated me before it hated you. <laughs> so we've got to keep that perspective. We've got to keep these truths in mind. We're not going to make our, be able to make ourselves pleasing to the world. So that really shouldn't be our goal. Paul wrote to Timothy just a little while, shortly before Paul himself was beheaded. He said, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you, can you finish that? Will be persecuted. Everybody, he said. And that's because the real enemy, of course, who is the devil, he's very intent on doing anything he can to hurt God's people, to render us powerless and impotent, to get us out of the battle. And anybody who's not willing to submit to our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ will very often be an easy pawn for the devil to use. I mean, he usually finds it pretty easy to convince unbelievers that we Christians are the problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't possibly be their own sin, could it? Oh, no. <laughs> Satan's very crafty, very subtle, and very wicked and murderous. So, guys, take me seriously here. Take God seriously. We have a very real problem that we have to face. We're in the middle of a very real spiritual war. It's not a game. It's not play. It's not just some Christian activity. No, we're in a war. And it's very sad, but there are way too many Christians who just seem to have a sense of helplessness in the face of these enemies. But God's not left us here just to wring our hands while we say, whoa, woe is me. Why is everything going wrong? What am I going to do? No, he didn't put us here to whine. <laughs> he's given us weapons and he's given us commands to take the battle to the enemy, to resist him. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. These are metaphors for Satan's ranks, his demons, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Why? Because he's given us weapons, and we're to use those weapons to get the job done. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians, for the, for the weapons of our warfare, you hear that? The weapons of our warfare, we're in war, guys, are not of the flesh, they're not fleshly, they're spiritual, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, we also need to understand that this warfare is going on at many different levels at the same time. We need to be aware of this, and we'll fight the war at many different levels. For example, there's spiritual warfare going on at the national and international level all around the world. There's spiritual warfare going on in many states and many cities. There's spiritual warfare going on in churches and denominations. There's spiritual warfare going on in companies, businesses. There's spiritual warfare going on in schools, all the way from pre-kindergarten, all the way through elementary school, junior high school, high school, colleges, graduate school. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare going on in many homes and in many of our lives at a very personal level, just, just our own relationship to the Lord, our own personal lives, and our own hearts, and our own minds, and our own bodies, we're waging very intense battles against a ruthless, cruel enemy named Satan. And so many Christians desperately need help in knowing how to wage these battles effectively. Some Christians are just getting badly beaten up by the enemy, and sadly, in some cases, they prayed about it, whatever their situation is, whatever the struggle is they're going through, they prayed about it a lot. And listen, don't get me wrong. I certainly believe prayer is incredibly important. We don't do enough of it. And it's part of our spiritual warfare. No question about it. But listen, guys, please don't miss this. Prayer is not the only weapon God's given us. And it's our responsibility to take him seriously when he tells us things in his word about how to fight the war so we can become more effective soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me point out one other thing that turns out to be pretty significant in our spiritual war. Now, this is important. Understand this. You understand God did not promise in his word that the Christian life would be easy, right? You know that? Make sure you understand that there are going to be many, many challenges and many, many trials that we have to pass through, every one of us. 
And of course, we have to realize he's using these things for many purposes, but ultimately they're making us more like Jesus. And ultimately, one way or another, the problems that we have in life that we'd like to just be able to snap our fingers and get rid of, (laughs) they're really opportunities. When God lets us go through problems, he's giving us an opportunity. And so in that sense, it's like an unrecognized blessing. I know it's hard, but there's one reason God tells us so many times in his word, count it all joy when you're going through the tough times. Because many times, if God answered our prayer the way we wanted him to, exactly when we wanted him to, we would look back someday and realize that didn't help us get more like Jesus. It was to our long range harm. It wouldn't have brought God the most glory. And that's what we're all about, right? Bringing him the most glory. Let me give you a classic example of this in the Bible. You remember the problem Paul had that he called the thorn in his flesh? And he asked God to take it away. That's normal. We usually ask God to take it away. But we always say, but Lord, your will be done. You know what's best for me. And in that case, God would not take it away. We don't know what it was, but God left it there. Why? Well, he makes it clear. It's to keep Paul humble and keep Paul useful in God's kingdom. Let's just read that passage real quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at this. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul had been given incredible revelations. For this reason, look at this. To keep me from exalting myself. In other words, to keep Paul from spiritual pride. There was given me a thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. (laughs) For power is perfected in weakness. Now look how Paul responds to that. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast what? I will boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Isn't that an awesome passage? When we look back on this life from the perspective of eternity, and it won't be long. We'll all be there before you know it. And when we get there, it seems so brief. We're going to recognize that many circumstances of this life, which we would have done almost anything to change, were actually very important tools in God's hands to make us more like Jesus. So we acknowledge that. But with that in mind, there may be many other times when what God's really teaching us is how to engage in effective spiritual warfare. And sometimes he allows the problems to persist so that we will learn how to fight the enemy. And we'll look back and say, boy, if I just used all the weapons at my disposal, I could have had that victory a lot faster. (laughs) See what I'm saying? So the problem may be allowed to persist in order to teach us to engage in in effective spiritual warfare. That's at least one possible reason for some of the trials we go through. Remember, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Also, I'm sure you noticed that we've been given weapons with an S at the end. It's a plural word. And we need to use them all. In a physical war, if we were engaged somehow our nation in a physical war, we wouldn't dream of just ignoring or laying aside some weapons that might help us win a victory. Well, it's even more important that we as Christians use all our weapons because we're in a far greater war. It's not just a physical war. It's a spiritual war raging all around us, and we need to use all the weapons. We live in a time when many Christian believers, unfortunately, have been kind of lulled into a sort of spiritual stupor, a kind of spiritual dullness, a a sort of a sleepiness, spiritually speaking. It's not easy to discipline ourselves. None of us enjoy discipline, do we? Even if we're in this world, in this physical world we're living in, you know, we have to discipline ourselves to do well in school or discipline ourselves to do well in sports and other kinds of activities. We know it requires discipline. And, and just spiritual life is no different. It requires a lot of discipline. The Bible makes it clear. God makes it very clear in his word. Discipline is not an option. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians think it is. You know, when you listen to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, the last thing on the list was self-control or self-discipline. Remember that? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but you may have heard somebody say, you know what? I'm just going to let the Lord fight all my battles. And that sounds pretty spiritual, doesn't it? But we better be very careful here. There's a danger if you 
listened to very much of what I've tried to teach before in Scripture, the Bible studies that I've done. There's a, you know there's a danger that we Christians have of being tempted to delegate back to God what he's commanded us to do. You see what I'm saying? If God commands me to do something, I can't just in prayer delegate it back to him. Say, Lord, you do it. And God said, no, I've told you to do it. You see what I'm saying? Let me give you some examples of that. God gives us very clear instructions in his word for, for how we're supposed to help and love a brother or sister who's fallen into sin of some kind, how we're supposed to, what we're supposed to do to bring them back and to restore them. But that's not always easy. It's kind of unpleasant, maybe. And so we may wind up saying, well, it's not my place to talk to them. So, Lord, I'm just going to delegate that back to you. Would you bring them back to repentance? Would you work in their heart? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray like that. We need to pray that God would grant them repentance, but we have to be disciplined enough to do what he's told us to do. We can't just leave it all up to him. You see what I'm saying? Not when he's told us to do things. Same thing about witnessing or sharing Christ or soul winning. You know, we may be tempted to delegate that back to the Lord. Lord, uh, you know this person's lost, but it's kind of awkward for me to talk to them. So would you just work in their hearts and draw them back to you and grant them repentance and faith? Well, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying a prayer that God would work in their hearts. But we've got to do what God commanded us to do in terms of sharing his truth with others, proclaiming the truth, proclaiming the gospel, making disciples. See what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with praying. Don't get me wrong. We need to pray that way. But we just must never try to substitute praying for obedience to God's other commands. Prayer is not the only command he gave us. So in the same way, he commands us to wage spiritual war against the devil and against his demons. And prayer is part of that war. But we must not try to substitute prayer for obedience to his other commands. So I could say, Lord, I'm just going to leave all my spiritual battles in your hands. I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm going to let you drive off Satan for me. Well, okay, maybe as long as we don't try to substitute it for God's command for us to take up the full armor, put on the whole armor, take up the sword. You see what I'm saying? I hope that's clear. I'm repeating myself, I know. God requires that we be disciplined followers of Christ. Listen to some of his words here about the warning of the danger of being lazy and undisciplined. This is in Luke 21. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Self-control, self-control. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, just a physical award. But we and imperishable, but we still have to exercise self-control. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Preparing your minds for action. It requires discipline, guys. You can't just sit and let it happen by osmosis. It won't happen that way. Look at this one. You're familiar with this verse, I bet. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So over and over again, God warns his kids, we are to be alert and we're to be self-disciplined and we're to be ready to engage the enemy in effective spiritual battle. So am I getting through? <laughs> Effective spiritual warfare is not a matter of just sitting back and letting God do it. It's not a matter of just pushing the right buttons to get an instant fix. You know, it's not a matter of learning the right words to say to the Lord or whatever to just get an instant fix. It requires discipline, perseverance, thinking. God makes it very clear. Let me add one more thought here before I launch into some of the more specifics. If you've watched, again, many of my Bible studies, you'll know that I believe one of the most important principles in the Christian life is finding God's balance. We're walking through this life. God's got a straight and narrow path for us, but there are ditches on both sides of that path. And it's very easy for us to see the danger in one ditch and fall into the other ditch. And so we have to constantly make sure we're staying balanced. That, that comes through prayer, but it also comes through study and thinking and maybe letting other Christians help us. But I can imagine at least two ditches and extremes that can come with this material I'm sharing with you in this spiritual warfare series. On the one hand, 
it might be tempting for some people to say, oh my goodness, there's way too much stuff here, Steve. Give me something simple, okay? Just give me a little simple outline. Can't do it. In order to become an effective spiritual warfare, we've got to commit to a certain amount of discipline. So we're not going to accomplish much if we just say, well, I just look, give me something easy, okay? Just let me have an easy way. Give me a little card or something. <laughs> Listen, guys, most of life is like this. Requires some mental exercise, some mental energy. Spiritual exercise, spiritual energy. The other extreme, though, might be a kind of, I don't know, you might call it legalistic bondage or something to what I'm sharing. You know, you, we can get kind of enslaved legalistically thinking, boy, I, I must not leave that verse out. If I leave that verse out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose the battle. Or if I, if I leave that little point out, I'm going to lose the battle. Uh, that's, that's not good either. You know, we, we, we can fall into a pattern, for example, if you really were to memorize a lot of the stuff, I'm going to be encouraging you to memorize. We can say the words without really thinking about what it means even. Have you ever known people that, that pray the Lord's Prayer like that? You know, you can pray the Lord's Prayer or maybe the 23rd Psalm, some things you've memorized. You can sing wonderful hymns and great songs of praise without even thinking about what you're saying. You realize that? <laughs> so we're not just talking about rote stuff here. We're not talking about the kind of legalism that says, oh, I mustn't leave out that point or that point. What the, what the Holy Spirit's going to do as you in, internalize these things and get this in your heart and mind, He will bring up verses and thoughts and things that you need when you need them, as long as you've done the groundwork, you've done the disciplined work, so you're ready, so you're equipped. So look for God's balance here. Now, I just want us to look briefly at a couple of passages of Scripture before we stop today. We've already looked at some of this, and we're going to get into more detail in, in upcoming videos. But listen again to what God says about this subject. And remember, this is God's Word, guys. This is God's word. It's not something men made up. We need to take God very seriously. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you will extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. That's God's Word. So we're going to stop here today and pick it up here next time. Father, you know much better than we know what's going on in the spiritual realm around us. You know what Satan's doing and what his demons are doing. And Lord, we know you could stop them in an instant with a word. But you've commanded us to fight. You are using Satan to make us more like Jesus. And Lord, that's hard for us to understand sometimes and certainly hard for us to engage in the war. But Lord, you, we know that you've required us to do this. So Lord, please help us not to be lazy bums. Help us not to be lazy kids. Help us not to be so distracted by the things of the world that we don't have time to discipline ourselves, to get into your word, to learn these principles, to learn these truths, to memorize your scriptures so that we can wage an effective spiritual war. We want to be warriors that are effective. We want to be effective in the battle. And we want to stay in that battle until you call us home and we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So here we are, Lord, beginning this process of training and getting equipped for effective spiritual warfare. 
Help us to be disciplined. Help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to stay balanced and use us for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.